Part four, three men in a boat, Jerome K. Jerome. I objected to the sea trip strongly. A sea trip does you good when you are going to have a couple of months of it, but for a week it is wicked. You start on Monday with the idea implanted in your bosom that you are going to enjoy yourself. You wave an airy adieu to the boys on shore, light your biggest pipe and swagger about the deck as if you were Captain Cook, Sir Francis Drake and Christopher Columbus all rolled into one. On Tuesday, you wish you hadn't come. On Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, you wish you were dead. On Saturday, you are able to swallow a little beef tea and to sit up on deck and answer with a one sweet smile when kind-hearted people ask you how you feel now. On Sunday, you begin to walk about again and take solid food. And on Monday morning, as with your bag and umbrella in your hand, you stand by the gunwale waiting to step ashore, you begin to thoroughly like it. I remember my brother-in-law going for a short sea trip once for the benefit of his health. He took a return berth from London to Liverpool and when he got to Liverpool, the only thing he was anxious about was to sell that return ticket. It was offered round the town at a tremendous reduction, so I'm told, and was eventually sold for 18 pence to a bilious looking youth who had just been advised by his medical men to go to the seaside and take exercise. Seaside, said my brother-in-law, pressing the ticket affectionately into his hand. Why, you'll have enough to last you a lifetime. And as for exercise, why, you'll get more exercise sitting down on that ship than you would turning somersaults on dry land. He himself, my brother-in-law, came back by train. He said the North Western Railway was healthy enough for him. Another fellow I knew went for a week's voyage round the coast. And before they started, the steward came to him to ask whether he would pay for each meal as he had it, or arrange beforehand for the whole series. The steward recommended the latter course, as it would come so much cheaper. He said they would do him for the whole week at £2.5. He said for breakfast there would be fish, followed by a grill. Lunch was at one and consisted of four courses. Dinner at six, soup, fish, entree, joint, poultry, salad, sweets, cheese and dessert. And a light meat supper at ten. My friend thought he would close on the £2.5 job, he is a hearty eater, and did so. Lunch came just as they were off Sheerness. He didn't feel so hungry as he thought he should, and so contented himself with a bit of boiled beef and some strawberries and cream. He pondered a good deal during the afternoon, and at one time it seemed to him that he had been eating nothing but boiled beef for weeks, and at other times it seemed that he must have been living on strawberries and cream for years. Neither the beef nor the strawberries and cream seemed happy either, seemed discontented like. At six they came and told him Dinner was ready. The announcement aroused no enthusiasm within him, but he felt that there was some of that £2.5 to be worked off, and he held on to ropes and things and went down. A pleasant odour of onions and hot ham mingled with fried fish and greens greeted him at the bottom of the ladder, and then the steward came up with an oily smile and said, What can I get you, sir? Get me out of this, was the feeble reply, and they ran him up quick and propped him up over to leeward and left him. For the next four days he lived a simple and blameless life on thin captain's biscuits, I mean that the biscuits were thin, not the captain, and soda water. But towards Saturday he got uppish and went in for weak tea and dry toast, and on Monday he was gorging himself on chicken broth. He left the ship on Tuesday, and as it steamed away from the landing stage, he gazed after it regretfully. There she goes, he said. 
There she goes with two pounds worth of food on board that belongs to me and that I haven't had. He said that if they had given him another day, he thought he could have put it straight.